Welcome back, everyone. To start up the afternoon sessions, allow me to welcome a panel discussion on climate change in Southeast Asia to be moderated by Samali Gata from the group from the focus on the Global South. Okay. Samali Gata is executive director of Focus on the Global South. For over 25 years, her research and writing has concerned economic and social development in Asia, especially the Mekong region and India. Shamali, I would like to cede the floor to you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, first question, can, uh, can you hear me okay? Can you see me all right, Jerry? Just give yeah. me an indication, please. Yeah, your voice is okay. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, good, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our session on climate justice in Southeast Asia. This session is jointly organized by the Asian Pacific Movement on Debt and, Debt and Development and Focus on the Global South. You already have been, I've been introduced. I'm Shalmani Guttel with Focus on the Global South. Please allow me to introduce our co-organizer, uh, the coordinator of the Asia Pacific Movement on Debt and Development, Lidi. Lidi Nakpil, Lidi, can you please um, just say a quick hello? Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event uh, this afternoon. Very, we are very happy to be co organizing this with uh, Focus on the Global South and to have uh, a number of our members uh, join us also in this event, including some of our speakers. Thank you, Lidi. Um, now, just for everybody to know that this session is being uh, broadcast live on a number of different channels. And um, so I'm going to request all, I mean, all our speakers to speak slowly because it's also being translated into a number of different languages. Now, uh, the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, the report from them has re just released on August 9th in 2021, warns that climate change is intensifying very rapidly in every region of the world and across the whole climate system, and that many of the changes are already set in motion, such as sea level rise and uh, the erosion of coastal areas, and these will be irreversible for over at least hundreds of years. Southeast Asia is home to diverse microclimatic regions and ecosystems, which are the foundations of the livelihoods of numerous ethnically and culturally diverse peoples. Over the past decade, the region has experienced very severe cyclonic storms, floods, heat waves, and increased fragility of certain uh, territorial systems, such as the Mekong Delta and other coastal areas, upland areas, and riverine areas. Of course, these changes have had very severe impacts on the food, economic, social security of the region's peoples, especially indigenous peoples, local communities living in already vulnerable conditions. Climate change is exacerbated and its impacts have also been amplified by the extractive development model followed by Southeast Asian governments. Instead of transforming deliberate development visions and strategies towards genuine sustainability, governments have intensified the rush towards economic growth resulting in increased deforestation, destruction of riverine and marine ecologies, urban expansion, industrial agriculture and aquaculture and mariculture, and also mineral and fossil fuel extraction. But in contrast, many social movements, unions, civil society organizations, and academics from across the region have repeatedly raised the alarm to society, to the public, and to policymakers about the urgency of changing the economic paradigm that drive policies and practices and that shift financing away from fossil fuels, industrial agriculture and aquaculture, large infrastructure and energy projects towards supporting renewable energies, agroecology, small medium scale mass and public transportation and other public infrastructure to move us towards genuine transformation. So in this session, we will discuss and learn from our speakers what are some of these proposals for transformation towards genuine sustainability and climate justice, linking climate justice with other forms of justice at various levels from local to international. We will have five speakers in this session. 
Our first speaker will be Lidi Nakpil, the coordinator of the Asia Pacific Movement for Debt and Development in the Philippines. And uh, Lidi has been a campaigner on the issue of justice, starting from debt, gender, uh, people, taxation, finance, and she has been a pioneer in linking the struggles for climate justice with other forms of justice. Then we will have Hendro Sankoyo from the Smooth School of Democratic Economics in Indonesia. And Hendro has been working with local communities in Indonesia, bringing, linking trends, global trends with territorial forms of justice in Indonesia. Then we will have Titi Suntoro from AXI for Gender and Social Ecolo Ecological Justice. Titi has been, was one of the founders uh, also and launchers of the Asia Pacific Movement on Debt and Development, along with uh, uh, Lidi and other members of FOCUS. Titi is an active feminist and a practitioner of mindfulness um, and peace principles, and has been linking feminist and local organizing, again, linking local and global and regional trends on climate justice, um, on non extra, on fight resistance against extractivism and on sustainable development. Then we have Rojan Entet from Tedurai Lambangian Youth and Students Association, the TLYSA in the Philippines, an indigenous people's organization, which has been uh, working on their own and to promote their version and their own vision of what is sustainability. And then we will have Saw Alex Tu from the Karen Environmental and Social Action Network, KSAN. Kesan is a community-based, non-governmental, non-profit organization that works to improve livelihood security and gain respect for indigenous people's knowledge and rights in the current state in Burma. So without further ado, let me hand over to our first speaker, Lidi. I request all speakers to try and keep within 12 minutes so that we can also have time for some questions and for a final round of inputs from our speakers. Lidi, please, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you, Shal. Um, well, based on the guidelines given us as speakers for this panel, I'm supposed to tackle the first uh, really quite difficult question is, what is climate justice? What is climate justice? I remember that we first used this term as movements when we formed the Climate Justice Now Network to get together with Focus on the Global South and many other groups when we were in Bali, Indonesia in 2007, where the COP, uh, what number of COP was that, <laughs> Shalmali, do you remember, Titi? COP 13, uh, I believe, or? COP 10, I think. think. COP My 10. God. COP 10? <laughs> We've been through so many COPs. 2007, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. COP 10, I yeah. think. <laughs> and we felt that, you know, uh, at thus far at that point, uh, when people were calling for climate action, when movements were, different groups were calling for climate action, somehow the messages and the analysis and the demands that go with what was very uh, much being taken up by many groups at that time was a bit short of what we wanted to convey. No? So we started uh, using the term climate justice. Probably somebody else invented that a long time ago, but we started using the term climate justice in order to capture what it is we're fighting for. So what is climate justice? I think it, it answers the following questions. One, how do we stop climate change? How do we stop climate catastrophe? How do we solve it? So what are the different things that should be done in order to stop global warming and stop climate catastrophe? But how do we do that in a fair and equitable way, recognizing that not all countries or classes or groups of people or institutions have the same responsibility? No, even the UN Climate uh, Convention acknowledges that there are different responsibilities. We, we are all commonly responsible, but there are different responsibilities, especially when you consider the historical role of countries, of classes, of movements uh, in the whole development and unfolding of climate change. So how do we do that in a fair and equitable way, recognizing the differences and responsibilities 
And how do we do that? Recognizing that one of the great injustice of climate change, not only are the impacts devastating, but the fact that those least responsible for climate change are the ones that bear the greatest impacts, right? A third question is how do we do the process of stopping so that the transition or what is called the transition, the process, the transformation is also just because it requires huge changes in our societies and there will be impacts even of those changes, not just impacts of climate change, but the change that needs to be done will have impact. So how do we ensure that the transition or the process is just? And uh, another question would be, how do we make sure that at the end of the day, when all these transformations are done in order to stop climate change, we arrive at the place where the social order is far better you know? so we're not just protecting the life as we know it today we're seeking another life another social order to build one that is more just and more humane more equitable and more sustainable it's not just about sustainability it is about justice it is about equality uh, it is about building uh, lives of dignity a quality of life for everyone on the planet considering the system that we have today is far from that. It's a system where the majority, especially women, indigenous peoples, workers, farmers, are marginalized and exploited. And then a final question, how do we pursue this change and this solution while at the same time be mindful that impacts are already here and it, they will get far worse before they actually can get better before we not better but before we actually stop the process of climate change because many of the changes as the ipcc report that shalmali was talking about is already saying that many of the changes are irreversible so how do we arrive at the place when the world is much more equitable just and uh, how do we do that while at the same time addressing the impacts that we are already facing now. So in the UA, in the climate discourse, uh, how do we do adaptation? How do we address loss and damage? How do we enable and empower people and communities to deal with the impacts that are already being um, uh, felt now, that are already being experienced now? So the first question, stopping climate change in a fair and equitable manner with just transition, requires many concrete things. These are big words, but it requires many concrete things. And one of the uh, hugely urgent and immediate ones is shifting away from our fossil fuel energy systems. And by shifting away, it's not just stopping the expansion. How do you stop the expansion of coal, oil, and ga gas? By leaving them on the ground, stop exploiting further and uh, mining coal, uh, stop exploration and, and extraction of gas and oil and leave them in the ground because the world has no more space or no more time for, for expanding further the fossil fuel industry. And contrary, what we need is a rapid phase out of the fossil fuel industry and shift to clean and renewable systems. And and all this requires a timetable. It's not something that you just pursue at the time and the pace that you please, that you're pleased with or that you want to do. We are running against time because the scientists are telling us for us to prevent climate catastrophe, the world should be decarbonizing by middle of this century, fully decarbonizing by middle of this century. So that's just about less than 30 years left. And we need to phase out fossil fuels completely before that point, before mid-century. That's why right now, as we are speaking, uh, there's the UN General Assembly, there's the UN high-level dialogue on energy, and one of the important calls we're making is stop further expanding coal, oil, and gas and, and pursue a rapid transition uh, to clean and renewable energies. But climate justice also demands, it's not just any kind of renewable energy system. 
It has to be a renewable energy system that places first and foremost the objective of providing people with access to energy enough for their basic needs. Our current energy systems is not only wrong because it's based on fossil fuels, it's also wrong because it's based on the needs of corporations, the needs of big business, the needs of pursuing capital. So the kind of energy system that we want to replace this with is not just fossil fuel free, it has to be democratic, not corporate dominated energy systems that are primarily meant to fulfill the needs of people. So that's one big issue, the energy system. 75% of the greenhouse gases, of global greenhouse gas emissions are from the fossil fuel energy systems. And then we come to another major point. We have to transform the rest of industry, especially those that deal with agriculture and land so that we transform them into sustainable systems. The dominant food and agricultural systems of the world are not only flawed because they're not meant to provide people for their basic food needs, and, and they're being run in order to pursue capital. That's why they're dominated by multinational corporations. They're also wrong because they're based on agricultural systems that are not sustainable, that are responsible actually for 25% of the rest of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So there is an urgency to transform land and agricultural systems to stop deforestation, but not just that, we need to undertake massive, what they call massive ecological restoration. We can't just stop uh, doing the wrong things. We need to restore uh, as, as much as possible uh, ec ecological health you know, to the earth, to the planet. So massive ecological restoration because uh, this is also has very much to do with climate change among other environmental considerations like biodiversity because what keeps the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what helps maintain them or bring them back to a healthy level is the natural carbon sinks, which are due to forests, to clean water bodies and so on. So these are important to restore, to as much as possible restore them back to ecological health. So these are the urgent uh, things that we need to do in order to stop global warming, which according to that same IPCC report that Shalmali referred to, is already saying we are 1.09 degrees warm, warmer than pre-industrialization levels. And we've all agreed that the safest level still possible to stabilize global temperature is at 1.5 degrees. So that even the Paris Agreement of governments are saying that the goal should be to keep it below 1.5 degrees, and that's the threshold. And the reality is that same IPCC report and other reports are also saying that unless we undertake immediate actions in the next few years, this goal will be already beyond reach. Yeah, so to keep it within our reach, of course, it's important, all these long goals, uh, decarbonization by mid-century and so on, but these goal, long-term goals will be useless you know, until, unless we do the things that must be done in the scale and speed that they must be done in the next few years. Otherwise, that goal will be out of reach. That's why this is the most critical decade. Uh, this decade, what we do this in, in this decade spells the difference whether we can save the world from further extreme catastrophe or that we or we can keep the goal of a healthier, safer, not so safe anymore. We're still we, we are facing the impacts, but that's the the what is possible till uh, today. You know? So unless we do what needs to be done in the next few years, that goal will no longer be possible to reach. Um, and that's where I come in to the second question, what do we ask our governments to do? And that relates to also another element of climate justice, which is we need to ensure that the solutions are shared in a fair and equal way. And one of the most important uh, realities here is that 
those who are most responsible, no, the country, the the glo the world's uh, highest historical and continuing emitters are those that must do more than anyone else. And this is not just a question of justice, it's also a practical question. If you're the most responsible for what is causing the problems, then you have to do more, otherwise we can't solve the problem, right? So we need to push this wealthy governments who are doing the most to create climate change, to contribute the most to the problem. So they have to cut down more emissions they have to provide the finance that is necessary for the world to undertake these emissions reductions and for our people to do what is uh, what they must do in order to deal with the impact. So the first push is not, not just our governments where we live. Uh, one of the first push, not the only one, the first push is the governments of those wealthiest countries. So it is a global fight. It's not just a fight a national fight vis-a-vis -vis our governments, it's a global fight. And not just governments, corporations, although governments are responsible to rein in discipline and even dismantle these harmful corporations, but we're not just dealing with the corporations that we see in our countries, we're dealing with global, major, huge corporations that are responsible for the uh, biggest chunk of global grass, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Then our governments, our governments in the ASEAN, our, our countries, while we contribute much less to the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of the world, there is, we also contribute. And we are going to increase those emissions unless we stop this development paradigm that we're trying to copy from the world's wealthiest nations or that they're imposing on us, whatever the case may be, or probably both. Uh, and we need to make sure that we also transform our energy systems. We need to make sure that we also transform our, our industries, our agriculture, the way we use our land and natural resources. So our governments must also do their fair share in this whole thing. Our, the, the corporations that operate in our, in our countries, and we all know uh, after all is said and done, the, the, the governments of the wealthy corporations I mean, the wealthy countries, the corporations, our own governments, the corporations that operate in our countries, they are not going to do the right thing unless they're forced to do it. So I think the ultimate responsibility and the ultimate hope we have for climate justice is what we do as people, as communities, as movements, because we, we the, nothing will change unless we compel this uh, governments, these corporations to change unless we we force them to act and unless we also dismantle the relations of power, you know, the power they have over us by building our power and by building new alternative structures and systems in our societies. In the immediate governments and corporations must be compelled to do the right thing, but in in the process, we also need to transform these governments and to transform these corporations, to dismantle the corporate power, because ultimately in the end, if we don't do that, we will not arrive at that place where we have a new social order, where we have justice, where we are safe from uh, environmental uh, destruction, where the world is a healthy planet, we live in a healthy planet, and when we can say, we have arrived at a world of justice. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't go so much beyond, beyond my time, Shal. It's okay. Thank you very much, Lydia. Thank you for a brilliant overview. Uh, now, I will, I'm just looking to see, I think, uh, to see if uh, Yoyok has been able to join us. Mr. Hen I don't think he has. So let's move on. Um, in order to keep gender balance, I think what I'll do is move to Rojan now. Rojan, why don't we have you and then we'll have Titi. Uh, so we'll have a sort of a gender balance in our speaking. So Rojan, uh, your, the floor is yours. Please uh, try, in fact, not try, but do please keep to 12, 12 minutes. I think Rojan has a set of slides that he would like to share. Right, Rojan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So I'm going to share on this one. Yes, yes. And I will remind you when uh, time is up. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you, Rajan. Go ahead. Can you see my uh, my slide? Yes, yes, yes. We can see. Go ahead, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone, for the Philippine time. Before I start with my very short presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of this very this very meaningful activity for inviting me as one of the speakers. Yeah, my name is Roger Nilted. I'm 25 years old. Uh, one of the councils of the Dry Lambangian Youth and the Association. So this afternoon, I'm going to share to you the practices of the indigenous people, specifically the Dry Lambangian in South Central Mindanao. How can we uh, preserve and protect the environment for climate justice? Uh, for those who are not familiar with who are the Tudurai and Lambangan tribes, actually the uh, Tudurai and Lambangan tribes are belonging to 100 indigenous people, 110 indigenous peoples, identified by the, by the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples or NCIP. Uh, this is a primary government agency for the uh, for the indigenous peoples in the Philippines, created under Republic Act 8371, known as Indigenous Peoples. Rights Act of 1927. I don't know if you are familiar with our current situation under uh, the newly established Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, today, Yoyuk, Yoyuk, so, I mean, sorry, uh, Rajon, sorry, yeah, I think uh, we're getting an echo. So uh, are you using a headphone or are you on? Yeah, 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 I'm using headphone. I think I'll uh, use headphone. Okay. Uh, this way, uh, sorry for. Yeah, if it's possible to just make some adjustment because it's difficult for the interpreters, if okay. you don't mind. Okay. As what I say, that uh, I don't know if you are familiar. This is fine. With our current situation uh, in the barn, the, the newly established Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao has replaced the uh, defunct. Autonomous region in Muslim now the arm before. So, uh, with indigenous peoples, okay, how much we value the nature environment? With indigenous peoples, strongly believe that environment is the basic source of food, uh, where you get medicines and materials for the home. It is also where our culture, uh, tradition, and customs are rooted. The environment is the extension of life and the body. Hence, it is necessary to preserve and maintain the people's closeness to nature and good relationship with the environment. Thus, it is strictly prohibited to do any activity distracted to the environment. Uh, there are many studies in the world have shown that the indigenous managed areas are rich in native vertebrate species than in all other areas including protected areas by the government. These comparisons confirm that positive step to maintain or enhance already existing values on indigenous managed lands have the potential to substantially advance global biodiversity conservations. So how, how can we define uh, what is development for us? Uh, when we say development, this is for indigenous people's perspective, specifically the Tudurai and Lamangian tribes. Uh, we can say development for us when there is a peace of mind for the tribe. Uh, there is equal opportunities, meaning don't, no discrimination for employment, education, and other government services and programs, for each other. We can say oh, we can say development also if we have a healthy surroundings. Forests cannot be destroyed. The natural resources cannot be degraded and free from different pollutions. It must be called also, it must be cultural sensitive based project or development, meaning before they implement the project, the programs or the projects, they must undergo free prior and informed consent or FPIC to ask the indigenous communities if they need it or not in their community because the indigenous peoples have the right to refuse or accept whatever development um, brought to them by the government or non-government organizations. Right? Also, when our rights to self-determination is fully recognized and protected, that's one indication of uh, development for us. And also, if we can fully manage and develop our own resources, 
It also important to have our ancestral domain. It must be recognized by the government because we cannot live without our ancestral domain or lands. This is where we practice our cultures and traditions and freely implement our customary laws as our day-to-day -day basis of life. Then we can have full authority in managing and protecting our surroundings, including the nature, of course. It must, it must be also there is cultural integrity where no one is discriminated based on their religion, tribe, culture, political affiliation, and gender orientation because we believe that IP rights are human rights. Then, uh, then we have the TMI Justice and Governance. It is our highest governing body or tribal governance to, to formulate policies, programs, and services for the tribes with, with, with the rule of customary laws as we use for our for day-to-day for -day basis of life. So TJG or TMI Justice and Governance is a trad traditional system of governance or leadership that practiced by the tribe since time immemorial up to the present. Um, let us look into the uh, traditional way of indigenous peoples, specifically the uh, Tedurai and Lambangan tribes in the Southern Philippines in managing biodiversity and conservation. Actually, we have the Sulagat, uh, Sulagat system as practices of uh, the Tedurai and Lambangan indigenous peoples. Is that the right term? Uh, is that the right Lambangan term for everything edible? Can be sold, uh, can be traded with other items for basic needs, both plants, animals, birds, and fishes, whether planted or domesticated by human beings, or naturally growing or running in the forest on and on open land flying on the air and swimming in the water that are readily available for human needs. It is an indigenous system and practice of sustainable and environment friendly system of livelihood and utilization of forest, land and water resources. Right. Um, there are they are, uh, these are where the Sulagat system actually uh, originated in at the right term. So we say that Sulagat is Magad because it, it is easy to gather, cook, and serve. Tagad Tagad means fight to hunger because while you're still living, of course, you need to eat to survive. Sulagat also, if a gather on, medicine for different illnesses. Because uh, in the forest, you can see different uh, medicines, no? herbal medicines that you can use for to, to cure illnesses. Then, um, yeah. uh, Sulagad is also is, is the extension of life, or their fa for now. Uh, um, we cannot survive without the environment or nature because everything we need can be found there unless you are no longer a human being. Uh, Sulagad is a lifelong practice. Uh, we cannot survive without the environment. Uh, Sulagad is lifelong practice. This is already part of our culture and tradition. It, it just inherited to us by our great ancestors that we need to practice it pass into the next generation. The Sulagad is, all, Sulagad is bank or in a literary bank where, where you deposit money and, and withdraw. Uh, there is a saying that if you have planted, you will have to harvest. Sulagad is helpful during drought or climate change because uh, as our experience in the community, uh, there are uh, forest crops that we used to eat for survival during crisis time. Sulaga is source of healthy living. Why? Because sulaga is is a pure organic, no chemicals like the food that we always eat from the market. It is directly get from the nature. That's that's why it's good to our body. 
uh, designed by the ancestor, knowledge and wisdom. Sulagad is, uh, we have learned Sulagad from our ancestors. They taught us how to do Sulagad. Not, we, we did not learn it from any scientist or someone, but it is inherited to us by our uh, ancestors, or that is their knowledge and wisdom. Uh, number 10, Sulagad is simula, uh, symbolizing of good citizen. Um, if you are not doing Sulagad, you are not a good citizen anymore for the uh, indigenous peoples. So we have here the five components of Sulagad. Sorry. Uh, number one is the minor crops, uh, like uh, rice, corn, major crops, yeah, yeah. Yeah. major crops, permanent crops, raising of animals, and forest crops. Then, uh, Amidst, amidst these good practices by the, by the tribes to preserve and protect the nature as well as the environment, there, there are environmental threats and to the lives of indigenous peoples, not just in South Central Mindanao, but also in, in other places. Uh, number one is aggressive development, actually a big problem to all uh, indigenous peoples, not just in our country, but in the world, this is either brought by the state or government, individuals and non-government organizations like big companies and among others. Uh, in the context of the Philippines, any development brought to the IP communities without their consent is illegal because there is a law specifically for the recognition, promotion and protection of rights of all indigenous peoples in the Philippines and we call it Republic Act 8371, also known as Indigenous Peoples Rights Act of 1997. Sad to say that despite to this law and other international treaties for the indigenous peoples, the injustices committed against the indigenous peoples are continuous, like illegal logging, uh, entering, to their, entering to their community, illegal fishing, mining, road widening, establishment of factories and airports or seaports or any chatera. There should be a free prior and informed consent before implementing all, all of this, okay? Within the ancestral domain of the indigenous peoples because that is uh, what the law say. You know? uh, the indigenous peoples have the right to refuse or accept uh, what kind of, whatever the projects that need to be implemented in their areas because uh, that is what in the international law say even in in ipra law just simply look into the picture on my screen that was in 2002 when the miners tried to enter in the ancestral domain of dulangan manubu, manubu tribe in libak sultan kudarat province the good thing during the time uh, where, all the, where all the tribes are united to stop them. So the, so the mining operation in the area was not succeeded because of the joint force of the community, uh, specifically the, all the tribes within that area. Um, okay. Sorry. Number uh, one threat. Rajon, to, uh, I'm sorry, Rajon. I'm sorry, I will have to ask you to, to Rajon, I have to ask. Indigenous peoples is the armed conflict specifically in, in Mindanao. Uh, the resiliency of the indigenous peoples in the COVID-19 pandemic is determined by the status of their ancestral domain or lands, especially the condition of their uh, of the natural resources and environment and the level of modern development in their areas. Another factor is their cultural practices by this the current civilization and the most challenging situation now among the IP is the new normal, such as hygiene protocols, restricted moments, and social distancing, among others, due to the pandemic. At the height of the national emergency, declared to combat the spread of COVID-19 as early in March 15, 2020 in the Philippines, series of attacks happened mostly to the indigenous communities, uh, Rajan, where we can counted you hear me? almost 3,300 IDPs or internally displaced person within that month. 
And the most of the evacuees are the Tedura and Nambangyan tribes. So, so that during lockdown or, or under quarantine, the indigenous communities in the Bangsamoro region, uh, even the whole Philippines, which are even more suffering as they face also uh, forced occupation of ancestral lands, harassments, killings, and hostages from non-state actors resulting to displacement. Until Hello? now, they are still sustained massive land grabbing and aggressive occupation of traditional villages in the, of the, in the IP communities. Because of this, uh, we are urging the government and other international organizations to implement peace mechanisms in, uh, in the affected IP communities. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rojon, I have to really, I'm sorry, Rojon, can you hear me? So this is our initiative, youth initiative. Uh, despite the challenges we always encounter, we never stop asserting our rights and campaigning for climate justice. If you see the picture on the screen, the Kaisa and other partner organizations uh, organize an activity entitled Eco Walk or Walk for Humanity and Environment. More than 800 youth volunteers coming from the different tribes and organizations join us in the campaign walking, walking the almost 26 kilometers from Upe to Putabata City. The main objective of the activity was to remind the government and individuals that our mother earth is getting degraded. Because the main, because uh, the environment is degrading. If we love humanity, then we must preserve and protect our environment. We can, we can, we, we can do a lot to save our mother earth. Yeah. So, so, and also another uh, initiative of our, of our organizations, we, we do also outreach programs to the IP communities, especially in uh, affect, conflict affected areas, peace dialogue, you know, relief assistance to the displaced. I think we. Leadership training. I, Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rojan. And um, we are very short of time and I was trying to reach you to point out that I think your speaker was off. So I'm going to respect all the speakers to please uh, re try and please respect the time because we do want to hear from you, but we also want to have uh, time for some questions at the end. So now let's move on to Titi Santoro from Axi. Or is yours? Uh, thank you, Shah. So I'm tasked to talk about uh, what the feminist means with climate justice for women. And then I also remember that the, the slogan of there will be no climate justice without gender justice was also come out during the COP 13, not 10, uh, in Bali. So it means during the COP in Bali, there is a lot of uh, movements and their call for climate at the time. Uh, can I continue? Yes, please continue. Oh, and just, okay. uh, that we are hearing some back coming from the interpretation. So oh, please yeah. be careful. Yes, go ahead, Ititi. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So we call for climate justice for women because climate problems exacerbates the, excess, the existing injustices. And if we talk about climate problems, it's, it's not only about climate disasters, but we also look, need to look for the climate response measures. And then both climate change and climate response measure occurred under the intertwined powers of patriarchy, globalization, militarism, and fundamentalism. So climate issue is not coming into the, a place where there is nothing, but it comes to a place where already problems existing. So we need to consider all those factors that exacerbate the impacts of climate to the lives of peoples, including the women and also the, the family and environments. So then the climate change and its response measure, 
worsen the existing inequality and the living conditions of the people. So the, uh, the ability to adapt to climate change in men and women is highly dependent on access to and control of our resources, including income, natural resources, infrastructures, and services such as energy or water, as well also knowledge about the climate risk, strategies to deal with the climate issues and available assistance to the communities. If we look at the women, women are more likely to be adversely affected by climate change than men because they constitute the majority of the world poor. They are often directly dependent on, on certain natural resources for their primary source of food and livelihood. And women also often face discriminations, harmful stereotypes and social, economic, and political barriers that limits their adaptive capacity. They also face limited or unfair access to financial assets and to services, information, education, land, resource and decision-making processes. And they have less opportunity and less autonomy. So within that context and issues, there is a market-based solution for climate problems that allows those to happen. You know? Public and private climate financiers prioritize the low carbon or GSGs energy projects while ignoring the social, economic, and environmental sustainability of the local and indigenous people communities. Moreover, they also ignore the rights of the people to information, decision-making, water rights, and to healthy environments. So we call for climate justice for women. It means we need a transformative economic development that changes existing extractive way of doing business into the sustainable and regenerative low carbon GSJ economy. But the low carbon economy must not be about changing types of energy sources from high carbon into the low carbon. This solely way of thinking is massively if we look at the government's private sector business and so on. So they think uh, that transfer of, of economic system is actually transform uh, of energy sources, changing energy sources. It's not that what mean, we mean. And also we don't want to have a destructive, massive clean energy projects, you know. You know, there's a, there a now massive clean energy project coming to, to us, which is very harmful, like the geothermal, like massive wind, uh, wind farm, or what do you call it? Wind energy farm. So the economic transformations and its transition to reduce GSG has to strengthen the resilience against the climate change. The, the transformations must put primacy on the sustainability of livelihood and human and women's rights. It should also address inequality within our economic system and recognize that a transition of the economic must have gender equitable benefits. We also need energy democracy. It, it means prioritizes energy for communities rather than for industries and give the communities, including their women, the power to decide about the energy sources they want to use. Moreover, we also need to have a recognition, reducing and redistribute the care work that mostly women do at home and also in public, which should ultimately contribute to dismantling gender division of care work or labor, increase community contribution to the care work and public services. This means is to acknowledge that care work is not solely women's work at home or at the, at the society uh, because of the patriarchy. Contribution of community should also 
put into the care work. So, and the last is the women wisdom and experience must be the base of decision making in regard to any project's intervention, be it for climate, for development, or investment. So those are some thoughts regarding climate justice for women, Shell. So thank you for listening and happy to have a further discussion for this. Over back to you, Shell. Thank you. Thank you, Titi. Thanks very much. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, women are, you know, do majority of the work in all the spheres. And there can really be no climate justice without gender justice, because regardless of any sector, women are there more than 50% of the population and carrying much more than half the sky. Thank you. So now we move on to uh, Hendro. Hendro has been able to join us from Indonesia. Uh, Hendro, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shao. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a problem to fix uh, earlier, so I'm so happy to be able to join all of you. And uh, I hope I can uh, uh, share a bit uh, the um, some of the uh, field notes uh, from uh, uh, common and collective works uh, over the past uh, one and a half decades. Uh, particularly in the archipelago. This is really a um, crucial time actually to share uh, thoughts like this. So I hope I can uh, share my screen. Um, I can go directly for sharing screen, right, Shaw? Sure. Yes, yes, please, please go ahead, yes. All right. Um, So I hope uh, you can see uh, the screen. So <clears throat> this is the, um, the framework um, or the uh, term of reference that, uh, uh, that I supposed to um, uh, address um, climate justice in the framework of dignity, life spaces and territories. Um, of course, this is um, something uh, easy to to read or to say, but it's extremely difficult if we go the uh, conventional pathway uh, of learning. One thing that I'd like to share uh, is that um, there's this uh, very serious trap uh, that, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, infected many of us. Uh, sometimes I'm included and all that that uh, this is the proverbial, uh, proverbial elephants, you know, how, how can you fit an elephant into the fridge? So we sort of having uh, or must imagine that everything can be handled, uh, don't worry, including, you know, the worst of all, the uh, climate crisis or the breakdown of the uh, thermal regulations of the earth. So this is the first uh, warning uh, actually for all of us. Uh, on the foreground and uh, in the kampongs, barangas, and all these, you know, uh, daily uh, situations. Uh, one trick that actually, uh, you know, it's very rampant and ubiquitous is uh, the so-called uh, darkroom trick, where you see things upside down. You know, uh, in the ideological work, it's uh, called uh, camera obscura effect. So, uh, and let's see the world upside down. What, what does it mean actually? Uh, well, first of all is that we are, you know, enticed into uh, focusing particularly on the uh, climate crisis as an economic phenomenon. Uh, the first warning in fact actually uh, comes from uh, Sir Stern that if we don't do anything, uh, the global GDP will go down uh, to 30% uh, down and all this. So climate crisis is destroying us and our life space. There's nothing wrong about that, but uh, the uh, darkroom effect number one is uh, let's fix it. So what should we fix is the climate crisis as such as the downstream problem. 
And of course, uh, we know about this. Uh, it's the carbon molecules, you know, misplaced. Uh, and, uh, you know, our common friend, uh, Larry Lohman, you know, uh, has been helping us a lot and in, in discussing with us, you know, uh, all of these uh, language games. So it's about fossil fuels. Of course, it's true. And we should really fight, you know, against coal and all this. But the energy extractive industrial nexus claiming that they are working hard fixing it. And so we sort of uh, being enticed again into uh, something like a false solutions and proposal. So proposal number one is go renewables, go low carbon, go green. And uh, it's very clear that actually the true costs, for example, for a lithium carbon battery, you know, will actually should include, uh, you know, all of the drudgeries, uh, uh, victimized people, uh, bloods, uh, you know, that's already shed uh, on the islands where the battery minerals, you know, uh, are deposited, particularly in the case of nickel, that will, you know, will be the core issue for the uh, electric mobility, for example, the Philippines and Indonesia, you know, are big on the picture. This is a portrait from uh, the island of uh, Sulawesi, where the whole islands is actually uh, a single stock of the largest nickel uh, in the world, uh, laterite nickel. What about other renewable energy? This is uh, a snippet from resistance of women uh, on the island of Sumatra against geothermal plants. That's claimed by both international NGOs, uh, commercial conservation NGOs and uh, the industries, uh, the World Bank, of course, is that this is really, you should go for it. And, uh, you know, uh, the island Southeast Asia is really uh, the home for this huge bonanza, but at the same time, it is also the capital of the ring of fire with all these uh, you know, problems with uh, induced earthquakes and all that. So if you want to go low carbon economy, green energy, this is a picture just from one single island of Jaffa where actually all the life spaces, the dignity of women, uh, children, uh, elderly, the uh, historical social entities of people that stay there for you know, um, millenniums, basically, you know, it's going to be wiped out completely by all these energy projects, both dirty and clean energy projects. And this is the picture for, uh, you know, people in the uh, framework of uh, Southeast Asia in general. You can go to proposal number two, for example, just focus on the, uh, where the most concentrated people are. So uh, this is approach, of course, from uh, the planners, the uh, UN habitat and all these uh, you know, promoters of uh, nice sustainable uh, urbanisms. So from uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, this will actually distort and uh, digress our uh, focus on you know, uh, the real uh, solutions because for sure uh, problems are not concentrated only on the, uh, you know, on the urban centers. Even in the urban centers, this is what happens. This is, um, um, would be a classical uh, photograph in Indonesia where in Bandung, uh, the third largest uh, uh, city uh, in Indonesia, if not the fourth, uh, this is a friend of mine that actually uh, their last uh, bastions of, uh, you know, um, uh, basically uh, traditional uh, housings um, in the cities being wiped out by new uh, projects. I think you are very familiar with this. And this is how the islands across the archipelago is being sacrificed exactly for the uh, energy transitions, Green New Deal for, Green New Deal for, uh, for Asia, and all this, uh, you know, uh, demand for uh, battery uh, minerals. 
You can also see it uh, historically. This is the fate of the uh, Borneo Islands or Kalimantan, where basically, uh, as uh, Titi and other speakers just said, um, you know, it's all there. You know, it's the uh, the ignorance and the uh, enslavements of uh, the real people. Uh, in, you know, in the face of the uh, imperial and uh, accumulation agenda. So now, is there no alternative or is it? So step number one, I think we should take distance from false corporate solutions and proposals. Go as far as possible from the discursive system and practices that's supposed to, you know, uh, no, nice on the ears and uh, very logical and all this, and it gives you money, in fact, you know, if you uh, go with it. So step number two, you, while you uh, stay away from all this uh, uh, language game, recenter on our dignity, life spaces, and territories. This is a portrait of about historical, social, ecological entities. We uh, call it it's just a temporary constructs. For uh, Eastern Asia, uh, we, we learned together uh, from Shell and friends uh, in the Mekongs uh, four years ago. And you know, we see exactly the post-colonial uh, Southeast Asia is now reintegrated by this uh, extractivism uh, par excellence. Step number three, Justice should not be surrendered to the hand of the diluted planners. Be very, very careful. So we ordinary people, you know, can do it right where we are. We should scrutinize what kind of economic activities, what kind of uh, obstacles, what kind of internal problems we have. And we should uh, somehow uh, solve that and come up with very local solutions. And then all these, uh, I would say, uh, solutions for the people should be realigned with the crisis uh, at the uh, global level or biospheric level. This is, sounds very ambitious and how to do such a thing. And we come years ago actually with very simple principles. If for example, you have $1 million uh, being put into your life space, would you say yes or no? And an old woman, probably unschooled, will be able to say upon these principles, if it produces negative effects for the people and for our home uh, nature, then we should say no because it's on the third quadrant, so it's negative, negative, both for the human and the uh, nature. If both are positive, no matter how small, it's worth in money terms or in economic terms, we should grab it. And this is actually one of the blind spots of the degrowth movement, because for quadrant one metabolisms and economic modes, we need to push further, not just growth, but super growth within the quadrant one uh, categories. So to sum up actually, if we don't do uh, the things that I just reported to you, we will you know, we'll go in circles. And when things get worse in terms of uh, you know, climate crisis, for example, in terms of floods in the Mekong and all that, it's uh, no news anymore. Even the uh, Arctic Circle is now, you know, being uh, sort of sacrificed. Then actually the uh, state managers will go deeper into the crisis by using exactly the same logic. So what uh, we propose is actually, we should, first of all, stay away from this uh, logic that's centered on the economic uh, rationalities. We should go with, uh, a discursive or you know a practice a daily practice that's centered on human being and on the uh, uh, home in crisis our life spaces it consists of three uh, simple principles one is actually uh, we should practice the rationalities as as hard as we can uh, 
And then the second, we should come not with big, you know, scaled up uh, protocols at the country or at the regional level, but with the contingent applications of these rationalities in very local protocols, particularly for the indigenous peoples and the uh, peoples uh, being sacrificed, you know, for the sakes of, uh, you know, uh, endless expansions of capital. Um, this is one of the, uh, you know, um, early uh, attempts for us in trying to exactly, uh, you know, walk the talk. This is uh, come from uh, four or five years ago. Uh, so we uh, conducted um, very um, serious, long discussions, roving workshops with the women uh, shamans throughout uh, the island of Kalimantan. It's not that we want to be a Balian or shamans uh, in the first place, but we want to understand what exactly is climate crisis in your daily life. And since when did your grandmother tell you about this? Is there any dramatic change into your life today? And how would you define climate justice? This is uh, my friend, our common friend, uh, Mama Supina. So, uh, you know, teaching uh, indigenous dances as, um, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, giving, uh, boosting uh, moral of the younger generations, girls and boys and all that, is one of the resistance and one of the proposal from uh, this particular um, uh, activist. This I'm is. Sorry. Uh, Yenok, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I will have to ask you to wrap up soon, please, because hey, we are over this time. Is the, the, this is the two uh, last uh, slides. This is also one of my friends. Uh, sometimes we, of course, must uh, deal with it, uh, with all we have. And uh, Patsy is one of them that, uh, you know, uh, to defend. Uh, her lens from uh, cement factories, which is part of the uh, new economy. Uh, she uh, you know, passed away right when she uh, conducted the protest with friends. But uh, this is uh, her friends. Uh, until now, um, they still fight. And this is actually, uh, uh, I will leave you with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. This was very helpful. I mean, you brought in politics, philosophy, vision, and a whole different way of thinking in terms of a paradigm shift. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Now we move to Alex from Kesan. Alex, the floor is yours. And Alex, you can share your uh, slides directly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sha. Um, thank you, everyone, for inviting uh, me to this uh, regional conference or, or climate uh, change. And um, of course, th there are a lot of uh, issues to discuss about. about uh, but allow me to uh, briefly present the, uh, the the struggle of uh, Cray indigenous peoples towards climate justice in in, in my territory. Um, so, um, I mean, we in Eastern Burma, current state is located in Eastern Burma, bordering Thailand. And then we are doing a lot of work on the conserving forest land and using the indigenous, uh, you know, uh, territories governance. Uh, so, uh, uh, current territories are the best thing of uh, nat nature and about diversity uh, conservation. And then, and, and and th these areas that we we have been trying to, uh, I mean, the work uh, together with Indian communities over the last twenty years constitute a large part of the donor territories Tenesuri landscape into Burma biodiversity hotspot. And uh, it's the largest remaining areas of contagious tropical forest. And uh, one of the most 
one of the world's most significant areas of biodiversity conservation. And currently in Burma, uh, we are seeing um, uh, a lot of challenges in the past 70 years. Civil has been uh, uh, already 70 years and over. And now, you know, the recent military coup uh, had increased a lot of armed conflicts in many parts of Burma, including the center uh, areas of the country. And then of course, the main problems of, another, you know, another major problems of the country, the central, con the central resource control. And uh, there's no legal recognition of traditional customary land rights in, 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 you know, in the country, in the constitution or in, in, in the laws. And then we see a lot of, you know, violent extraction and, you know, development aggressions in many parts of the country. And again, you know, last year we are seeing uh, the health crisis, the COVID-19 had, you know, uh, uh, also become uh, another major crisis uh, for for the country. Um, I'm, I don't I, I don't need to talk about the impacts of climate change everywhere. You know rainfall patterns. You know uh, you know decrease of uh, crop yields, temperature change. You know illness and agriculture. You know increase agriculture pests. It's uh, happening everywhere. And then again. The, uh, the indigenous people and the climate change. Uh, we are um, seeing that you know the indigenous territory is covered with twelve percent of the Earth's surface and holds eighty percent of the planet's biodiversity. But still, you know the levels for registration are high in areas that have been declared by you know the government as protected areas compared to the traditionally protected areas of the indigenous uh, people. So um, for the Korean uh, people, nature and the Korean people are interconnected and deeply connected and they cannot be separated. And then uh, we believe that healthy environment leads to having a prosperous community and a sustainable livelihoods. So there, is a Korean, there are a few Korean proverbs that allow me to read these two. We who drink water must take care of the waters. We who eat from the land, must take care of the land. Only where we maintain the balance, where our well-being be sustained. Uh, one second. Uh, mother told us to save young species. Father, uh, father told us to save taro species. When we preserve up to the decades, we will not perish when famine comes. So these are the, the, the current uh, traditional proverbs that have been um, carried out through generations. So uh, allow me to, 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 to present the, you know, the indigenous initiatives or the Solway Peace Party has been established in 2018. So this indigenous initiative or the Solway Peace Park, the vision of this Peace Park is to foster peace, cooperation and cultural resilience, sustainable natural resource management, bioculture conservation and local life improvement. And, and uh, the Salary Peace Party is located in the southeast of Burma. And um, in this peak spot, there are different type of land use clear classifications. And if you look at the map, you will see the blue spot. Uh, it covers 75% of the total uh, uh, land covers, and that they are customary land territories. And, and mainly these territories are mainly, um, you know, um, governed by, by the indigenous communities. And then we also have community forests uh, established by the communities themselves in, in, in the park. And then we also have the reserve forest and wildlife sanctuary. And then you see the, the blue and demarcated areas. These are areas uh, the under the control of the central government, so we are not able to, you know, uh, you know, demarcate uh, the blue area. And um, the Solomon Peace Park, you know, um, has its governing uh, uh, charter and governing uh, body. And uh, this charter, you know. Uh, you know, uh, well, uh, this charter, you know, um, it's a guide to 
uh, the governance of the Solway Peace Park. And um, the Solway Peace Park also promotes uh, democratic practices. So every two year, uh, they have this uh, election and uh, the representatives uh, are coming from indigenous communities, different parts of the areas, and also representatives uh, from civil society organizations and also from the uh, local government. So it's a combination of, uh, you know, different groups coming together, you know, establish this governance body. So that whenever there is development projects or, you know, or, or anything uh, that the government wants to do, they need to consult with the, the local communities and they need to uh, uh, discuss at, at the assembly. And um, we also, you know, uh, do a lot of strengthening for indigenous people, mainly, you know, governing the territories of light by empowering local governing institutions, mapping documentation of customary land and local communities' own rules, taboos, and values and history. And by establishing it, we also defend, you know, um, our customary land from the development aggressions and uh, sustaining, you know, livelihood practices while maintaining the territories of life. So these are the pictures of uh, indigenous uh, themselves, uh, you know, participating in land demarcation and mapping. And um, you will see women are also in the leading uh, group uh, uh, in, in forest conservation. It is only Peaks Park area. There are 34 community forests covering more than 36,000 acres of uh, land, land areas uh, of the total areas of the Solid Peace Park. And uh, these community forests are a vital, of, vital source of food and medicine. And uh, you know, uh, there are also a lot of community-based livelihood initiatives. And uh, one of the most uh, you know, successful and famous uh, initiatives are Rice Back and Native Sea Saving uh, uh, programs initiated by the communities themselves. And then, you know, the a part of, uh, you know, part of the, uh, the, the initiations is also, you know, um, continue to share, you know, indigenous knowledge to next generation. Uh, it creates a, a number of schools uh, and, and, and platforms and spaces for younger generations to learn from nature and environment. And, uh, you know, this initiative uh, that has been done by the communities lead to establishment of this peak spot actually. So the Peace Park covers one, more than 1.3 million acres of uh, uh, land uh, in Crown State, Eastern part of Burma. And uh, we, there are a number of research going on in these areas. And um, women also involved in the uh, biodiversity research, especially young women. And um, there are also uh, a lot of, uh, uh, because of this, you know, the creation of this uh, Peace Park uh, it leads to diverse and healthy wildlife. So in this Peaks Park area, you know, there are three wildlife protected uh, protection areas. And then uh, we have uh, done a number of uh, research on the wildlife. Um, there are a number of reports that we also produce, especially on the wildlife species and danger, you know, species and uh, newly threatened species in this area. And also uh, because of this initiative, we also see a lot of rivers coming back to uh, very clean. And uh, we see a lot of fish, you know, uh, uh, coming back into the streams and rivers. So communities continue to, you know, uh, organize themselves and uh, do a lot of uh, conservations, including fish conservations in many parts of the, the rivers and streams. And uh, these communities every year, we we try to uh, bring them together and uh, celebrate, you know, International Day of the Voice of Indigenous People to remind themselves that they are the most important people on earth. They are the most they are the they are the uh, the most important people that contributes to climate justice and you know contributes to uh, uh toward the light you know the battle uh, uh, uh war you know. 
And uh, every year we're also trying to bring these you know, indigenous people communities together to remind themselves that you know, the development aggressions are on its ways everywhere. And uh, this particular day, March 14th, is a day for rivers, rivers and against them days. That's where we, we try to remind the communities that the hydropower project has been proposed in the, in the Solid River and then they need, and, and uh, every year they release a statement and keep calling that they, they, they need to cancel all these hydropower projects in this, there's always a um, river. So these communities, you know, um, initiatives and these communities, uh, uh, you know, involvement in the uh, territory governance as part of the uh, the solid as part of the establishment solid peace pact uh, is one of the many examples of you know the local communities indigenous peoples governance that protect the water forest and uh, uh, ecosystems and also the you know uh, indigenous communities uh, initiatives uh, through this uh, solid uh, solid peace pact demonstrates that the communities Central governance supports both the protection of nature and the resilient communities in the face of global climate emergency. And it offers a ray of light and a different path to a better future. There are a lot of uh, issues that need to discuss at the policy level, at the national level, at the global level. But this, you know, a little small thing that we can do, especially working together with the communities not only in Cressy, but in many parts of the world, will bring us to a better future. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Shell. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much. This is such an impressive initiative. Um, and, you know, to be able to establish uh, the Salween Peace Park and such a large territory with so many or rather multi-territories with so many uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, protection, dignity, justice activities happening in the middle of Myanmar, which has been racked with so much violence and conflict is really not only an act of courage and dignity, but it's an inspiration. And I would like to repeat again, that phrase you put, which I think captures the issue of transformation that all the speakers have talked about, territories of life, um, thank you. So that's, that's, again, a very inspiring example to us for, uh, of the issue of climate justice. Uh, I'm just checking you, my notes to, uh, to see if there, if there are any questions. Uh, so far, no questions have been put. So, but while we wait for the questions, um, I would like to ask Titi Sontoro, uh, Titi, having listened to so many different presentations, um, how would you like to say a few more words in terms of how the feminist version or the idea of gender justice and climate justice would link with all? Because you took actually the least time among all our presenters. And um, it would be good to hear from you a bit more how do we integrate the, uh, the issue of feminist and gender justice into all these? Alex, of course, already talked about the importance of women in the Salvin Peace Park. Um, but it's very often when we are in talking about local and traditional issues, sometimes um, we are not able to overcome or, or, or cross over the traditional roles that women have to play. So Titi, I don't know if you would like to say a few more words on this point while there are questions coming. Sure, sure, Xiao. So if we talk about women, usually women is not women uh, themselves. If we talk women, women always relate themselves with the family and with their communities. So if we talk about the justice for women, it means also justice for women, their families and their communities. So the issue faced by women is actually, they are not in the decision-making processes. So their experience, their views, their knowledge are not considered important. But actually it is very important because they are the one 
who walk the path of the daily life, working for their family, for their communities and the societies. So one is about these uh, women in the decision making. It is important in all sectors. There's a lot of examples that women's contributions to the climate uh, response measure like adaptations, uh, you know, it's without considering the issue of gender or the issue of women and many, uh, in many of those activities actually increase the burden of women. So therefore they in the decision-making processes, it is important. I think it is, uh, and also respecting women's rights. I think in, in many in many layer of the society of the on, and on, on the lives, it is important to respect. You know, that's what I can say. That's a lot of things, but I think this is decision making, you know, women in the decision making, wherever they are, it is important. Whether it is local indigenous community, whether it is in the cities, whether in the big planning, it is very important. Otherwise, it looks bland, you know. <laughs> That's the short, uh, the short description, uh, Shell. Thank you, Diti. Well, actually, in a limited time frame of 90 minutes, everything is in a, sh is a short description because there are so many issues, issues to discuss. I'm looking again if there are any questions. Uh, while we're waiting to see if there are questions, just one request. Uh, could uh, Kitanath or Yang please put down, uh, write in the chat uh, the email address where all the presenters who had PowerPoints can please send the PowerPoints so they can, we can put them up on the mail website. Um, the correct email address to be put, uh, to, that, they, the, that they can send because Alex had a PowerPoint and Hendro and um, also Rojan had a PowerPoint. And if there are any other materials that any of our speakers, Titi or Lidi would like to send to put up on the mail website, they can be put up there. Thank you. I can send my, my presentation to who? Yes, yes. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking to be put on, uh, asking Kitanath or Ian to put a, to type into the chat. Oh, okay. A, an email address for every. All right. I'll, I'll type now, yeah. Yeah, please, please type the email address for everybody to be able to see that they can send all the presentations. Uh, because I think Lydia also had a presentation. Yes. I saw, I kind of like just spoke uh, extemporaneously. <laughs> okay, all right. Yes, but you have other materials. So. Yes, yes, yeah. I'll share that. Yes, okay. So in, uh, I think there are no more, there are no more, there are no presentations. No, I mean, no questions. Um, and no more presentations um, uh, uh, now. But um, Jerry, before we conclude, I would just like two things. Any, would any speakers like to make any one last 30 second remark? And then I will hand over to Lydia Nackville to give her final concluding remarks. Okay, I think no other speaker would like to make any last minute remarks? No? Okay. Then I hand over to Lidi Nakpil from the Asian Pacific uh, Movement on Debt and Development and the co-organizer of this meeting. Lidi, floor is yours, please. Take us yeah. into the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's time to say goodbye, but not the last goodbye because it's been a wonderful way for us to get together despite the pandemic. And uh, thank you for attending our event today and participating. Thank you to Shal for moderating. Uh, uh, I know the time was tightly packed, but we've learned a lot from all the speakers. I learned a lot from all the wonderful things that people are doing at the communities 
and also what our colleagues are doing in Indonesia, in Myanmar, and also in the Philippines. Uh, we have many important moments like this to learn from each other, but also to inspire each other because at the end of the day, we must go out into the world and apply what we learn and continue to build our movements, to strengthen our movements, to work with our communities so that we can uh, make system change happen as fast as possible. If there's one thing we need to remember all this crisis that we are facing and especially the climate crisis, it's reminding us that we have little time left. So if we were working very hard already, we must work even harder and faster to make change happen, to fight for justice, to fight for freedom, to fight for a better life for our people and our communities, especially the women who bear the brunt of all the suffering and the exploitation that is happening in this world. Thank you all and thank you again, Shal. Uh, you have you. put in the lion's uh, part of the work in making this event happen and we all really uh, extremely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers because this session would be nothing without the speakers. Thank you again. Thank you, Xiao. And a very big thank you to all our interpreters who are making sure that these very important messages from our speakers are reaching people across the region. Thank you. And a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samali, for your initiative moderation. So for now, we before we go into another session, let's take a few minute break. Uh, and we will come back at 3 p.m. So now let's take a break. <laughs>